wonder I'll be there. On that bright and young and sunny when the burning moon arrives, and the glory of his resurrection bear. percent growth from last week went from two to three hi y'all glad to see you glad you're here appreciate you coming um, I'm going to talk about what happens when you die And this might be one lesson, it might be two or three, it may never get done, who knows. But anyway, that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I do, um, let me remind you that this coming weekend, there is a Bible conference in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And Barb and I are going to that. And next Sunday morning, you will have the privilege of hearing Brother Clyde... Heron and Brother Dean Hodgson, two of the finest, and they will be here next Sunday morning. There will not be a Sunday night Bible class tonight, and there won't be a men's class next Saturday morning, nor will there be a Sunday night class next Sunday night. We're giving Chuck some time off too, and um, uh, so, but we we will broadcast here. And there, Clyde is going to teach Wednesday night as well. And so there will be a Bible class here Wednesday night. It will be online. And, um, and next Sunday morning, with the two of them preaching, Dean and Clyde, there will be Bible classes here. The Bible is exactly the same. Whether it's Clyde, Dean, me, or 16 other guys up here preaching, the Bible is exactly the same. Yes, I think we discussed that, didn't we? I think, I think Clyde and I discussed that. So, yes, he, I think he is planning that. So anyway, I don't know of any other announcements that need to be made, except that I've been told about a couple things. Thank you for telling me. Larry informed me that uh, Don Hodgson is going in the hospital Tuesday to have a couple of stints put in his leg. Is that right? One leg or both legs? Yeah, what did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. Don, not Don Hodgson. Don Hudgens is going in Tuesday morning to have stents put in. Uh, they found out what's causing the problem and, uh, and informed him he had to wait till they got the stents to put them in. <laughs> anyway, pray for Don and uh, continue to pray for Kay, who uh, had a blood transfusion this week. Is that right? Is that what you said? And uh, so... 
pray for her. And uh, help them if you can. Um, also, there's a birthday here today. It's Gina's birthday. How about that? Happy birthday. We will not tell anybody how old you are. However, I want to warn you, I know. Anyway, happy birthday. What else I need to announce? Okay. I guess nothing left. How about, would somebody like to take two minutes and give us your testimony? Tell us when you got saved, how you know you're saved. Terry. Come on up here. I mean, we're just giving you some exercise this morning anyway. Here, I'll give you a hand. Step up on the step here. Oh, you got it right there. In 1945, uh, we rolled into uh, Martindale in a 39 Chevrolet that had been a tree fell over the top of it, and my dad knocked a dent out in the top, and it had little red dents all over that, that <laughs> Chevrolet. Well, we rolled into Martindale about uh, 15 miles down and four or five miles down that way. And um, uh, I was about 10 years old. And uh, I was raised in the Baptist church. He was, he was called to be the Baptist pastor there. And so every time the doors were open, of course, I went to church. Well, I believed it. When they said that Jesus Christ died on the cross, I believed it. When he rose from the grave, I believed it. I believed everything they told me. I went to Sunday school, and they taught me all the little uh, the Bible stories, and I believed them too. Well, one day, I, when I was 10 years old, I walked in the back door of the house, uh, and remember seeing Terry and Eddie uh, inscribed on the uh, back doorstep. <laughs> uh, that was our, my brother and my... <laughs> uh, her dad became pastor in Martindale a few years after my dad. But uh, I walked in the back door, and my mother was sitting there with the... Uh, 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 a, a bowl in her lap and she was uh, uh, snapping beans or peas or something like that and I said uh, mom what must I do to join the church had the wrong question and she looked at me like I had done something wrong and she said have you been saved and I said yeah, I don't know and she says well, have you trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior? I said, I'm not sure. And she said, uh, let me make it simple. Now, I'm good at simple. I thank the Lord for simple. <laughs> he, she said, in the Bible it says, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust him, and you'll be saved. Well... I went out the back door, and I was thinking about that. Now, they had taught me about heaven, and I believed that there was a heaven. They taught me about hell, and I believed that there was a hell. I did not want to go to hell. I Amen. did want to go to heaven. Well, as a 10-year-old boy, I had a place to hide, which was under an old cedar bush. It was a cemetery of cedars, one of these tall kind. And underneath it was hollowed out where I could crawl up under there and uh, uh, kick the can or whatever game we were playing. But I crawled up under that old cedar bush and I said, uh, uh, Jesus, I want to go to heaven. Now, I don't know what I said. That was, that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I communed with the Lord Jesus Christ and I told him that I wanted him to be my savior 
And I wanted to go to heaven when I died. Well, my aunt who taught um, uh, third grade, I believe it was, most of her life, had a, had a saying for it. She says, and the child just breathed. Well, I just breathed. <laughs> I had trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, and I meant it. Amen. And when I crawled out from under that old bush, I knew I had a Savior. And I went on being a 10-year-old boy and doing what 10-year-old boys do, except for one thing. I had a Savior. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Terry. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? All right. That being the case, I want you to turn to John chapter 8. John 8. John 8, the two most famous verses in this passage are verse 32. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There is another really great verse in here because of identification identification purposes it's verse 44 Jesus said to those who were arguing with him and criticizing him he said you are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it There's only one real lie. It. But it said that he was a murderer from the beginning. What constitutes a murderer is to take one's life. (coughs) Now look, if you will, in same passage, same chapter, look at verse 52. I'm sorry, start with me in verse 51. Jesus is still talking to people who are arguing with him. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the you is about a bunch of people, not one person. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham's dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest, who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now I want you to take the whole of this passage and consider the difference between life and death. But the difference between life and death in the passage is the Lord Jesus. You see, these men said that Abraham was dead. Jesus said he wasn't. So not doesn't say he said didn't say. He said in verse fifty one, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And Abraham rejoiced in seeing his day. Well, then was Abraham keeping his uh, the Lord Jesus' saying? Yes, he was. Look up Abraham. Everybody, every place you can find him in the New Testament. 
Every place you can find Abraham in the New Testament and then tell me you think he's dead. Oh, that carcass that he carried around for 165 years, that one's dead. But Abraham's not dead. Abraham's alive. Because Jesus said, the first time Jesus mentioned Abraham, he said, many shall come from the east and west and sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham. Well, the kingdom of heaven, as far as physically and materially being in place, is still yet in the future, and yet Abraham's going to sit there. So is he dead? No, he's not dead. What is he? Turn to John 11. John 11. Jesus and his disciples find out that Lazarus is ill. Verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now I want you to notice, in the minds of the disciples, the confusion that arises about what Jesus says. He just got through saying, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Notice now, verse... um, Five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Is this mic still on? I'm getting feedback. Sorry. Um, verse um, 9. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well, meaning sleep is restful, I suppose. Verse 13, Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now why did Jesus have to do that? If he said he was going to go wake him out of his sleep, why didn't they know he was dead? Because the terminology is one about the flesh and the other about the soul. When he says plainly, Lazarus is dead, he gets there. Verse 21, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She thought he was dead. Because his body died. She thought he was dead. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Oh, so she didn't know about continual life. Oh, yeah, she did. But how was she measuring it? In the body. Notice verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall shall he live. Jesus knew and loved Lazarus. That means Lazarus knew Lazarus. And loved Jesus. Simple as that. So, verse 26, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Oh, the never die part is the new entry into the explanation of he sleepeth. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So they go to the The grave. Verse 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? How did Jesus say that to her? He said that to her by saying, He that believeth in me is never dead. Never dies. Never dies. He said it to her that way. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. 
Well, would that change from dispensation to dispensation? No, thank God, that doesn't change. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. The definition of how someone becomes alive in Christ changes by dispensation primarily because there is a change in the inheritance. But it's the same Jesus Christ, the same Lord of all, the same blood of Christ is shed for our, the payment of our sins, and the, the same resurrected Savior resurrects us all. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. That's, what he, that's who He was, what, how He was made. Made, by the way, made of a woman for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man how many men did he taste death for glad we got that cleared up every man for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now before we go any further here, look over in chapter 5. Verse 5 says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, on and on. Verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Why did Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God, fear death? He was in flesh. That cross wasn't going to feel very good, was it? The nails in his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns on his head, the manner in which the uh, heart and lungs, the respiratory system of the body is going to be ripped out of his chest by the six hours on the cross. That's not going to feel good, is it? That wasn't something that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in a body of flesh made of a woman, looked forward to going through. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But the good news is, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but as thou wilt. And the Father would have him die because the father I don't mean to belittle this either one of them when I say this but the father stuck to the plan there is no other plan of redemption if the father had been speaking to him at that time he probably would have told him reminded him of that that is the plan of redemption go back to chapter 2 <clears throat> And remember verse 10, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth the Lord, and they who are sanctified, the sons brought to glory, are all of one, for which cause he, the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of their salvation, Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, for, the, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And if you want to find him in the twelve singing, you can look in Matthew 26, and they did. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold I and the children which God hath given me, which is right out of Isaiah chapter 8, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now I want you to hearken back in your mind to Galatians 5.1. Everybody can quote that, right? 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Why not? Because you're at liberty. Why are you at liberty? Well, you're at liberty for several reasons in Christ, but the big deal is that Christ has set you free. He's made you free from the yoke of bondage. If you're free from the yoke of bondage, do you have any yokes of bondage? If you do, kick them out the door. Tell them they're not wanted anymore, those yokes of bondage. One of the yokes of bondage in this flesh becomes the natural will of man. Where did that come from? Look back in Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I forget the chapter. I'll find it when I get there. Chapter 3. Ecclesiastes 3. After the various times are described in the first eight verses. In verse 9 it says, What profit hath he, man, to every, son, to every man, every, every person on earth, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He, God, hath made everything beautiful in his time. Now watch this phrase. Also he hath set the world in their heart. Who did God set the world, whose heart did God set the world in? Man, the sons of men. He also he hath set the world in their heart. None of us, naturally speaking, want to leave this earth. You know why we ever say that we want to leave this earth? Because we're miserable here and we know we're not going to be miserable with the Lord. How about if you feel good here? Do you want to leave? You wouldn't get too many uh, naturally thinking people to say yes, they wanted to leave. Unless they thought they were going to go someplace, come back and tell everybody about it, and then everybody would want to go. What's the deal there? He put it in our hearts. He made this earth for us to inhabit it. In fact, the simple admonition, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, ought to be enough to understand that it's in our heart. From Adam forward, it's in our heart. I like this place. I like the desert. I like the green hills and rolling hills of the Midwest. I like the Rocky Mountains. I like uh, the uh, seas. I, I like the, uh, I don't care much for some parts of Europe that I've seen, but I like some other parts of that which I've seen. I kind of like Hawaii. All I'm trying to get you to understand about that is that's the natural man. The natural man wanted to stay in Hawaii to preach. No, the natural man just wanted to stay in Hawaii. We fool ourselves sometimes too, don't we? But it's in our hearts. We love this earth. So why would we fear death? Because we're a natural man. Jesus in his earthly body, the Bible says, feared death. Because he knew in the natural body it's going to hurt. But Lazarus was sick and he died. And Jesus said he wasn't dead. That's really good news. Now notice, if you will, I want you to go now to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. What a fantastic thing it is to have Romans 8 in your Bible. All 39 verses. But primarily for the one of what we're doing here today... The number one fantastic verse in Romans chapter 8 is number one. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I didn't write either one of those laws. But I have been and am a participant in falling under both those laws. The law of sin and death says if you break the law of God you will die. The law of the Spirit capital S 
The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus says that if you're in Christ Jesus, you will live. Simple as that. Go back to Romans 6. Romans 6. Verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, and according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we were baptized into Jesus Christ's body by one Spirit. Capital S there too, Holy Spirit. So he says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Hmm. That doesn't particularly sound at the moment like that would be a really great place to be baptized into his death. Yet it really is because Christ was not worthy of death. We were baptized into his death. Well, he wasn't worthy of death. Acts chapter 2 says that it was not possible for the grave to hold him. If I'm going to be baptized into someone's death, I'm glad it's someone who of whom the grave cannot hold, right? Amen. What a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. He's not bound to die. He's bound to live. Verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Sounds to me like to be baptized into the death of Christ is going to give me a new life. How about you? Verse 5. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Jesus said, I'm going to go wake up Lazarus. They said, but why wouldn't you want to let him sleep? And I'm changing the words to match the way we think about it. And he said, he's dead. And when he told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He was telling her a fantastic thing was going to happen right there. And it did. They rolled the stone away from the grave and he cried, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth bound. How did he do that? Hop. He just moved out there. They loosed him from the bindings. And he was well and whole. As a matter of fact, he is depicted in Hosea chapter 13 and 14. I think. That's the last two chapters of Hosea. He's depicted there. What Jesus did for Lazarus is shown there. In those two. And you know what it's for? It is for that great new nation of Isaiah 66. A nation born in one day. He's a type of it. What did Jesus just show them? The glory of God. Resurrection. The glory of God. The Lord said to Ezekiel, Speak to these bones. Well, who was Ezekiel? He carried forth the word of God. He said, Speak to these bones. He said, Son of man, shall these bones live? Ezekiel says, thou knowest. Speak to him, he says. Say this. Boom, boom, boom. Up they came. Why? The glory of God. Resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, spiritually speaking, would you say you have it? Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. Not was crucified with him, should be crucified with him, want to be crucified with him. It says is. Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Why should you live in him? Verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Why should you live in sin since you're dead to it? And why should you being dead to it think that that sin is a part of your life in Christ? Oh yeah, I know. The natural man keeps reminding you of that, right? Go back to chapter 8. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. 
But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh. Verse 9, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Hey, have you ever trusted Christ as your Savior? If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, did He seal you with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ? Did He give you life in Christ? Then are you in the flesh? No. Well, why in the world are you acting like it? Chapter 6, verse 2. Well, you act like it because so far, that's all you've got to experience except for the words on the page. What are these words on the page supposed to give you? What? Faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. What if you don't ever get the Word of God? You're going to have weak faith. What if you never ever again hear the Word of God? You're going to wind up thinking at the end of your life you ain't got no faith. Think that'll scare you about dying? Faith comes by hearing. There's a verse in the Old Testament, Isaiah, forget the chapter. It says, Thou, meaning the Lord, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on Thee, for he careth for Thee. Perfect peace comes from remembering what God has said to you. Perfect peace comes from remembering what God has said to you. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Perfect peace comes from knowing God's Word. Look down in chapter 8, verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Sin's the transgression of the law. Break the law, you die. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth, if the spirit of, Je- of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Bless your soul. It's not going to make your mortal body perfect. Your mortal body is still going to be mortal. He didn't say make it immortal. He quickens your mortal body. Why? It's your avenue of use. It's what you use. You walk around in it. I'm on the inside of this fantastic looking body looking at you that you're looking at, and I'm in here looking out at you. I got these binoculars, they're called eyes, right there. Binoculars. And I'm looking out at you. I know what you look like, but I can't even see you the way Christ sees you. I can't see you the way God the Father sees you. I can only see what you look like in the flesh you're wearing, which is dead. But by the Spirit of God in you, it is quickened to carry forth that which you are supposed to do for the Lord while you're here. You're free to do with it whatever you want to do with it. You're not under any yoke of bondage. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled against the yoke of bondage, goes for those of you who are saved. You're not in bondage. So the Lord won't stop you from doing anything. You want to go off and play banjo in a 12-man banjo band? Go right ahead. I, I'm not picking on anybody. I don't know anybody who does that. You want to smoke pot till the day you die? Go right ahead. People say, you're giving people a license to sin. We've discovered we didn't need a license to sin. It comes by very naturally. All I'm trying to get you to do is see the point. The point is, you belong to the Lord. You're in a body of flesh. It's called mortal, even after you're saved. But bless your soul, it will be quickened to be used for the Lord if you put yourself in that position. If you make your faith grow, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. How much peace is enough peace for you? I met a friend once, knew him quite well. He got saved. I tried to show him some things in the Bible and he said, look, I know I'm saved and that's all I want. 
Some 15, 16 years later, I run into him. He was one of the most miserable people I ever saw. Because that's all he had. And he couldn't remember it. I mentioned something about another man showing me the verses to prove eternal security. He grabbed a pencil and piece of paper and said, where are those verses? I need those. I guarantee you he needed them. He hadn't heard them in 16 years. He did need them. He was miserable. Lazarus went to sleep. Look in Roman, or 1 Corinthians 15. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to notice two things quickly and then the thing about sleep. Verse 2. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 3. Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Take note at Paul, what Paul delivered first to the Corinthians. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He delivered that first. Bear that in mind. Now notice, if you will, verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? This got to be a stupid thing to come out of this group of people, right? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Oh, why would it mean that their faith was vain if Christ was not risen from the dead? Because everything centers on how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised again for our justification. Well, what if he's not raised again? You ain't justified then his dying for your sins didn't work. If he didn't raise from the dead, there is no hope. Keep reading. Verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. When we raise not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. It irritates me that people who otherwise believe the Bible is God's word want to change the fact that the dead in Christ are asleep. That's very irritating to me. I don't see the point. If we go on and read every bit of this and we don't have time, if we read everything else in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, we're going to find nine times that Paul says that those who are in Christ who die are asleep. He says it nine times. Of Stephen, the Lord said, I mean Luke in writing what the Lord said, he fell asleep in Acts chapter 7. Jesus said Lazarus was asleep. Let me tell you something. 31 times in the Old Testament, Old Testament saints of God says they were, they, that they slept with their fathers. 31 times they slept. Didn't say they, went to, they died. In telling about them, as in the case of, I just lost who it was, it said that he died in a good old age. I don't know what a good old age is. 120? Abraham, 165? Who knows? The, a good old age. That's my point. That means he got all the way up to the end of it and it was still good. But let me tell you, show you something quickly. Look in Psalms. I think that's 13. Bad when you can't read your own writing. Psalm 13. David is lamenting here. He can't find the Lord. And he thinks the Lord can't find him. Read with me from verse 1. How long wilt thou forget? me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Now watch. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. The people of the Lord in any dispensation are not with the Lord today. Turn to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. He wrote this about 30 years, 32 years, after Christ died. 
to Timothy, his own son in the faith, to Timothy, with whom he was going to leave the entire body of doctrine for the church of the body of Christ to be spread around and on and on. Look at verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show. So his times are yet in front of him. Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Watch about Jesus Christ now. Verse 16. Who only hath immortality who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see does Jesus Christ in glory as we count days does he dwell alone yes he does how you know that? Paul would have been lying if he'd have wrote that verse and it wasn't true. Jesus only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. You know what I think that you ought to do with that scripture? I think you ought to just let it say what it says. Christ tasted death for us. If you're in Christ, you're in a body that is quickened to do His will. Otherwise, it ain't quickened. <clears throat> and one of these days, it's going to lay down and die. Or it's going to fall prey to an accident. Or whatever. Whatever happens. It's going to happen. The Lord God Almighty already knows your final day. But then he knew the day that he accounted you as dead in Christ, buried with him, and resurrected in him. He knew that day too. God provided a way that you heard how that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and was raised for your justification. He made it sure that you could hear that so that you could trust him as your Savior. And if you've trusted him as your Savior, and when you did... As Terry's testimony plainly shows, he knows when he trusted Christ as Savior. Simply. When you did that, God knew you were going to do it. You didn't surprise him. Day by day you go, five years, nine years, ten years, seventy-five years, and you don't do anything for the Lord. He knew that too. He knew that too. Well, no matter how poorly we might serve our Lord and Savior, I'm so glad He knew those days. And He knows the days that in this body you're going to draw your last breath. And He knows which of us, if any of us, is going to be alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. He knows which ones, if any of us are going to remain until the coming of the Lord. And I'm glad he knows that. But if I don't remain until the coming of the Lord, it ain't going to change nothing about my relationship with him. And it changes nothing about my eternal life. Because this body just goes away. But I'm not going away. When the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, I'm up and at him. Because he's going to shout my name. He's going to let me know I get to go. Right then. I'm alive. Ain't no telling what will kill this body. The way I've treated it, I'm surprised it's still alive. But that's not me. It's just what I'm using. Because my life is in Christ. Paul said... You're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. Praise God. It's His saving power. It's His Son's saving wish. It's His, it's God's glory. And it's eternal.
All things we have are in the Son. And the Son is in the Father. Would you stand to be dismissed? I want to say thank you for being here today. And um, again, we will not have a, a Bible class online tonight or next Sunday night. But we, uh, or the Saturday morning class. But we will have online uh, Wednesday night and next Sunday morning. And uh, pray for the Bible conference in Chattanooga and Barb and I as we travel to it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've given us. We thank you for the blessedness of all that we've spoken of here today. We pray that those things which we were right according to your word in would ring clear in our hearts. And if we did anything wrong, strike it from our hearts. So that we don't carry around incorrect words to say about the one who died for us and gave himself for us. Help us, Father, to know exactly what you want us to do and to do it in your strength and in your might. We thank you for salvation so freely given through Jesus Christ who bought us with his blood and in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here.